Now, uh, in Luke 10, chapter, we meet this, these two sisters, Luke 10, 38. Now it came to pass, as they went, that he entered into a certain village, and a certain woman named Martha received him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary, which also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. And Martha was cumbered about much serving, and came to him and said, Lord, dost thou not care that my sister hath left me to serve alone? Bid her therefore that she help me. And Jesus answered and said unto her, Martha, Martha, thou art careful and troubled about many things. But one thing is needful, and Mary has chosen that good part which shall not be taken away from her. You know, folks, crossroads and choices cannot be avoided by anybody in their lives. All of us will come to crossroads. Which road shall I take? All of us have choices to make. And mark you, you are responsible for those choices. And life itself is one big choice. Every day is a choice. How you are going to spend it. How much of eternal profit you are going to get out of each day. You know, some people choose to be haphazard, nonchalant, irresponsible, fitful, flirtatious. They just like to be what... Uh, like these butterflies, you know? Something nice there. Maybe I can get a little honey out of it or something. So flit there, flit here, flit here, go over. That's it. They're just a bunch of butterflies. They leave no mark. They're beautiful as long as they live, but they are short-lived people. Now, what kind of choice did Martha Mary make? A very difficult choice. You know, when a sister is hard at work, and another sister appears to be sitting idly. What are you doing? I'm sitting at Jesus' feet. Can't you see I am so busy with getting things ready for dinner? Don't you think you should be helping me? Everybody would think she should have helped. It was the most reasonable thing besides. Seems, in fact, highly improper from the humanitarian angle. 
You know, we all think as great humanitarian people, you know, people who are very concerned for humanity. See, we must do this for people, we must do that for people, humanity. But who is the person who will eventually lift humanity? Who is the person who will impact suffering humanity? It is the person who chooses Jesus Christ. So when people talk about humanitarianism and, uh, you know, it is a kind of blind alley. Selfish people, you know, you people send a lot of money, relief, relief, a big earthquake. First, some of the governments say, we can handle it, we know how to handle of our own natural calamities. We don't need anybody to come here and help us. Hey, we have got special trained dogs. We have dogs trained here in the snows of Switzerland. And they can smell the any survivors lying deep. No, we can do without you or your dogs. Arrogant kind of people. And after 10 days, a thousand people die under the debris of that earthquake. A thousand people who could have been saved. That's the kind of humanitarian type of world we live in today. You see, many of these things like Red Cross, nursing, medical relief, in many of these things, who were the pioneers? Who started them? People with a great Christian heart, converted people, who sacrificed. You know, my dear friend, so don't, uh, don't talk about this big humanitarian stuff. It is just a shallow counterfeit. Well, if I kill 10 million people, I can help 500 million people. So these 10 million must go. That is the kind of ideology that we have lived through. After nearly a hundred years, not quite a hundred years, but the communist revolution in Russia was 1917. Wasn't it? So, we have not yet re arrived at the century mark, but in this century, in the name of one ideology, how many millions of people have been killed? What? In the name of lifting others. Millions, countless. There's no real count. It's just a vague estimation. That is humanitarianism.
But when you come to the love of Jesus, nobody wants to count how many people have been helped by the Red Cross, which was begun by a very wealthy count. And when he was visiting Italy, he saw savage scenes of battle in which so many wounded people were neglected and left to die. He said, this should not happen. And so, with his Christian heart, he started this, that movement. The, nobody makes a count of how many millions of people have been rescued, saved. Nobody makes a count. You see, if we talk about spiritual revival, meaning spiritual revolution in the heart, change of life. All right. How many people who would go to prison have been kept from prison? Yesterday, this young, this doctor told us that the police caught him twice and his father got fed up with him and said to his mother, bundle him up in a carpet and put him before a speeding train. Let's be rid of this fellow. And the same man today is helping so many. Okay, my dear friends, how many people ha I have seen rescued from criminal life? That's all they were. They were professional robbers. That was their trade, that was their profession. But Jesus transformed them and made them into givers. Givers. All right. How much money has the government been saved? One young fellow was in one of my meetings. In Ireland, I believe, or Britain somewhere. And he, I asked him, hey, what's all this clean shaven head and all that stuff? Well, he said, I have just come out of prison. I've just come out of prison. Well, why did you go to prison? At that time, homosexuality and so on was a crime in Britain. Before 1967, homosexuality was a crime. Today, it is a fashion. I asked him, why did you go to prison? He said, this is why I went to prison. I'm just out of prison. But then he said to me, Mr. Daniel, what do you do about your problems? I was just a young fellow. Probably I was still unmarried at that time. 
or just married, I don't know. However, I said, the Lord Jesus keeps me out of the kind of stuff into which you have gotten. I too have got that kind of wicked drive. I too have got it. So, the boy was in tears. How many people have been delivered? People who are ready to murder. How many people ready to commit suicide? A man met me, a total stranger, and he said to me, he wanted to commit suicide with his family. He was a Hindu man, knew nothing about the Lord Jesus, but he turn, happened to turn to one of our telecasts by accident. And the Lord Jesus touched him. His whole family was saved. Of course, we do not have, we don't care. I don't care for numbering these things. I don't care for statistics. But the fact of the matter is that when Jesus touches one sinner, one wretch, One selfish young fellow, such as I was, what happens? What is the outcome? Of course, nobody um, takes a record of how much money the government saves, how many people were kept from hospitals, how many people were kept from AIDS and venereal diseases, how many people have been healed by the touch of Jesus. Of course, there's no record. We don't care to make a big advertisement of that nature. However, the fact of the matter is that one person's choice to sit at the feet of Jesus and learn, if I did not do so, what would have happened to me? You know, being a sports person, you know, when your heart is given to sports, like my heart was, and I was a natural sportsman, any game, I would come to the top. And as such, my, if I had just thrown away my life, saying, oh, I'm going to throw all my life into sport. I still play a little tennis. Amazing, you may think, but I don't have much wind, so I don't last long, but I still knock the ball around a little. Not quite like some of you, robust and strong people. You know, folks, one choice, I had to make that choice after my conversion. You know, I used to play a lot of competitive matches, you see. Matches, of course, took a lot of strength and concentration. Sometimes a whole day, you know, missing school and on the field, playing the game. And that leaves you a little tired. At the end of the day, you're being out in the hot sun and you're tired. 
However, I would never miss that time of prayer. I would go to the Lord and he would speak to me. He would, that prayer, that time of prayer became a time of recharging. You, you know, it would have taken a lot of resolution. Anybody would have told Mary, Mary, haven't you got any sense? Don't you see Martha working as hard as she is? And you have a special guest? Must you not just go lend her a hand? What you're doing is altogether unreasonable, almost unpardonable. Well, any sensible person would have told her that. But she was making a resolute choice against convention. Today, what does conventional life teach us? What do most parents desire? Let's think of parents. What is it they're rejoicing? You know, talking to a few people in Michigan or somewhere, you know, they say to me, I or, you know, some of the patients in the hospitals where I have been, what is their rejoicing? Oh, I have two sons or two children, two girls. I put them through college. Oh, they are proud of the fact that they put them through college. And, you know, they are big, earning a big wage. That is the conventional teaching the, and conventional wisdom of most parents today. What is the wisdom that we get from Jesus? It's a different kind of wisdom. Seek you first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. You know how hard it is to teach your child this one thing? How hard it is. For one to learn it, one has to learn it himself before he can teach it, of course. So, a father who never does it can never teach it. A mother who has never done it can never teach it. Seeking the kingdom of God first, it's a hard lesson and it gives me much sorrow when I find my own children failing and faltering. Yes, and I tell them, hey, listen, I was told that you preached in that place on this very subject, seek first God's kingdom. Are you doing it? Yes. So, choices. Here was a very deliberate choice which convention and good behavior would frown upon. That's not the way to go. What are you doing? Oh, I'm sitting at the feet of Jesus and learning. You know, we live in a very busy world. 
anybody who wants to really sit or kneel and pray and study God's word has to be disciplined. It calls for discipline today. The easy way is to spend a little time, oh, I'm relaxing at the television. You know, my dear friends, it's true we can kid ourselves saying I'm getting educated. But what a waste of time. And that's the way people spend their time. And if they want to go to the Lord and pray, there are so many people who would think, oh, you're wasting your time at your, these retreats. What are you going and doing there for three days, five days? Haven't you anything better to do? Sitting at the feet of Jesus? What good comes out of that? That's what people would say. But let me tell you, my dear friends, there is much that we have to unlearn today. It is very hard to unlearn our natural traits and inherited thoughts. See, there is a fund of thoughts which we have inherited from our parents, which are contrary to God's word. And to unlearn those thoughts, to discard them, is not easy. See, some of these cultural traits that are dogging people today, it's very unfortunate. You know, Christianity has made me international. I'm not ashamed to say that. Let me tell you, it may be true that because of my color, one or two people first, when I started preaching in Europe and England, one or two people, you see, after all, the British Empire was the ruler. So when a fellow with a brown skin began to speak in the 50s in England, well, you know, there were some brilliant people from the Orient or the East. There were some brilliant people. I was not one of those brilliant people. But after a sentence or two, people would begin to sit up and take note. Because they could sense that the presence of God was there. Now, my dear friends, however, this color business never affected me. I remember flying to Nashville. You know, the air hostess came and sat next to me. And she said, do you realize you're going to the south? I said, what? <laughs> 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 
Do you realize you're going to the south? <laughs> I had no such thought. Will you be all right? Oh, yes, sure. You see, friends, that poor girl was so solicitous, so concerned that I should not get insulted uh, as soon as I turned up in the South. And lo and behold, I was taken to a guest house. I was a speaker. I was going to speak at a Bible college for a week. And they took me to a guest house. And the lady of the guest house took one look at me. And she retreated. <laughs> and then some whispering went on behind the scenes. I didn't know anything about it, but some whispering went on. And uh, the boys who had come to receive me at the airport, they tried to calm the lady. He's a nice man, he's a good gentleman. <laughs> He is not bad, he is an Indian, but <laughs> you know, folks, I didn't care one bit. Eventually, of course, I was received and so on. However, I came across very little of prejudice. Very little, and it didn't throw me off. I didn't feel insulted, you know. Why? The Lord Jesus Christ was spat upon. They spat in his face. Why should I worry? Let anybody spit in my face. Now, my dear people, so the gospel lifts you above these things, social barriers, political barriers, national barriers. You see, it's what a liberation you feel. You love everybody. You do. And it is so wonderful. But there is a choice that you have to make. Now, when you turn to the 13th chapter of Genesis, you know, when God called Abraham, what a choice he had to make. This man was worshipping his own gods, his own whatever, and he was a prosperous farmer. And for him to relocate, you know, we think nothing of relocating in our modern times, but to go right across a continent, almost, to where East and West meet, practically. Well, what a choice that entailed. And he took that child, took that decisive step. Leave your people and your kindred and go to a country that I will show you. All right, he did so. What a choice. 
Can you, do you think you would have made such a choice? Yes, Lord, I'll obey you. Do you think you would have made such a choice? Renouncing everything? Leaving behind your wealth? And trudging off across the continent? To her, and anybody asks you, where are you going? I don't know where I am going. Well, the whole thing looks like madness, but that is how God chose Abraham and be began the lineage of faith. If you belong to the faith of Abraham and are in the lineage of faith, my dear friend, you have to make some costly choices too. Here, the 13th chapter seems a very tragic chapter to me. Eighth verse, And Abraham said unto Lord, Let there be no strife, I pray you, between me and you, and between my herdmen and your herdmen, for we be brethren. Is not the whole land before you? Separate yourself, I pray you, from me. If thou wilt take the left hand, then I will go to the right. Or if thou depart to the right hand, then I will go to the left. And Lot lifted up his eyes and beheld all the plain of Jordan, that it was well watered, everywhere before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah even as the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt as thou comest unto Zoar. Then Lot chose him all the plain of Jordan, and Lot journeyed east. They separated themselves, the one from the other. You see, my dear friends, that separation that took place that day in the interests of good relations. Let's, you know, our boys, our workers, our servants are fighting over grazing grounds and things like that. Come on, let's do the sensible thing separate, and then we can live at peace. In the interests of mutual peace, how long did this separation last? You know, from Abraham, his son Isaac and Jacob and then the 430 years in Egypt and then until Ruth you know before that when the people of Israel were leaving Egypt and returning or going back to the promised land, after all that passage of time, who was very alarmed? The Moabitish King Balak. 
So they had become enemies. Lot's Abraham's children and Lot's children. Their moral and spiritual heritage had become so different. My dear friends, look at this. These two men were together when God was leading Abraham over a slight matter in the interests of mutual prosperity and peace, let us separate. And it was done. After all those centuries, when God was fulfilling his promise to bring his children back, Balak, the king of the Moabites, was so upset. And he went to Balaam, that prophet, and said, Come, curse these people. Curse them. Look at this. What a length of time. And then from there to Ruth. By that time and the passage, think of all the attrition, the loss of life, the loss of souls. Oh, the spiritual loss. During all that time. And then Ruth returns to the lineage of faith. One choice. One person, one family, one choice. You know, friends, when we make choices out of our emotions or traditions or comfort or convenience, it is going to impact the coming generation. One choice. I notice that many people are unable to look beyond their wallets. Shocking. Just completely meaningless. What is my, how far is my wallet going to take me? How far can the dollar take me? If the dollar sinks, you do not know the kind of confusion that is going to come into international finance, and family situations. One simply, and that's all that people can look at. But the spiritual loss from one carnal, emotional decision Nobody seems to take note of. Just think of this. Leaving the lineage of faith 
Don't let it seem to be an easy matter to anybody. God put me seeing my weakness, seeing that I need prayer support. I believe God put me in this fellowship because I was a fitful type of person. Not that steady, no. And if I were not supported by the prayer of those around me and built up in my faith, I don't know what I would have been up to. I simply don't know. If I had gone on in my old ways, how much evil would have come out of me until, of course, God would have had to shut off that fountain of evil. See, the lineage of faith, choosing the way of faith, let it not seem to be a light matter to anyone here. It has consequences and repercussions that will carry through whole decades if Jesus tarries, it will impact the generations that you may never see. Faith. If you deprive your children of this lineage of faith, you have, in other words, planted a bomb which will blow up your whole family. Who planted it? You planted it. Were you there for the explosion? Probably not. By that time, you're dead. But explode it will. And you will lose what money can never buy. Faith. One choice. One crossroad of faith. You know, many of the choices that one makes with faith appear to be absolutely senseless. So often, don't imagine that all your friends and your neighbors will applaud you for your spiritual choices. No one will understand. When my father chose to obey the call of God, nobody understood. No one. But the outcome of that step of faith and obedience, how it is going on and on and on. As a matter of fact, unless we interrupt the flow for any selfish reason, I cannot see how the flow of blessing can be stopped. I just can't see it because 
even I cannot cover some of those regions to which the blessing is just flowing. Do you know? So many being used by God. So many. And with so many repercussions, one cannot gauge it at all. But remember, each one of you can set such a flow. An interminable flow of blessing when you choose. It may be a pure costly choice without the element of sacrifice, you're never going to make the right choice. You know, we think of our choices in terms of, well, will this work? Will this lead to greater prosperity? Will this mean my well-being, and so on and so forth. But remember, all true choices that are made by the Spirit of God will take you through the path of sacrifice. That's one of those necessary disciplines that we need. I think I have told you this before, but I will tell you this again. As I was on my way, and all the children, the five children were small, and we were on the train in Switzerland, to Germany, and it was such a hot day. An unusually hot day for Switzerland. And I had practically run out of money. You see, I had my tickets, but no money. And I was very thirsty. You know, this train only stops for a few minutes. Not very long, very short. But I found the usual faucets, which used to be on the old railway platforms, the water faucets. They were all sealed. I would jump out of the train and try to look for the faucet, but not a drop of water. Finally, I decided that with the few pennies or whatever which were in my pocket, I must get at least one can of Coke. And of course, the children were thirsty too. Very. And between us all, we had that one can of Coke. You see, I was going to speak in Germany. They were waiting to receive me. But there was this little passage on my way from Marseille and then with a stop in Switzerland and on to Germany. A little sacrifice will do no harm. Not at all. I never felt deprived. I never said, I don't have this, I don't have that, I don't have that. Never. 
I found my all in Jesus. My dear friends, today, because of our indulgence of self and because of our being so used to comfort, we seem to bristle and almost bristle at the thought of sacrifice. No. Anything that is required by this discipline of faith, which might appear like sacrifice, will come back to you with a thousandfold blessing. That is the way of God. But when it comes to the choice, it appears, oh, I'm sacrificing this time, I'm sacrificing money. Yes, to come to a retreat, it's a sacrifice of money. And with the gas prices as they are, it's not easy. And the leave situation and the job situation, you know, one of those that will be joining us today will be handing over to the company the computer and other things which must be returned because of the termination of his job. Yes. A little bit of sacrifice is not going to hurt us. In his case, yet the company itself is laying off thousands. But there will be these things. But God will give us grace to overcome these things. Let us pray. Let us tell God, Lord, I want the way that leads to pleasing your heart. It might seem like a big sacrifice. It might appear like hard discipline. But I want the way of Gracious Father, what a marvelous thing it is that when we sit at your feet, this marvelous gift of faith is given. And as we take in this faith, O oh God, Though we cannot see the future, though we do not know the generations to come, what a baton of faith we can happily pass on. But should we only leave a legacy of self, self-pleasing or self-indulgence. Oh, my Father, shall we ever be able to forgive ourselves throughout eternity? Though the glorified ones in heaven may not have regrets and sorrows, yet, Lord, should I fail to do what I 
ought to do by way of yielding to you and thus being a blessing to many how can i ever forgive myself though all men may say hey you have done other good things besides why do you worry no lord no good thing can compare to your will even as abraham pursued your will teach us lord teach us let it not be a digression of several centuries as in the case of lot's family before one more bites could return to the lineage of faith oh my father save us from such tragic choices that will scatter our progeny and ruin their future save us lord save us we want to be those who walk humbly with our god i do not know the hidden riches and treasures which you have hid in each one of these dear friends as you help them to transcend and rise above all the barriers and limitations of our culture or our times the political barriers the family barriers whatever barriers lord our god you are able to give to us that heart which was in jesus who through sacrifice gave himself an offering for us so help us also we beseech you to be those who carry through these things in action in obedience in love that the outcome will be an outcome that will bring much glory to jesus so help us in jesus holy name amen